Yay! Or are you... I, I feel like people can't wait to get a pint of Guinness. That's what I'm feeling. Um, but this year in EuroPython, we, ha we are doing things a little bit different. Um, so some of you may notice that we only got four confirmed slots uh, for the lightning talk in person here because we have reserved some slot for the remote lightning talk. So if you are watching us remotely, you can actually sign up for lightning talk. Just pay attention to the venue list. We would, um, you know, uh, put the sign up link there tomorrow. So uh, pay attention. Uh, so today we have a uh, remote lighting talk uh, from our good friend uh, VB. <laughs> so um, are we ready for the first lighting talk? I don't know how it works, but yeah, we'll see. Hello, hello. Okay, VB is. Oh, oh hey, VB, hello. Hello, hey, oh, hey, Okay, hey, uh, you are giving a lighting talk, right? So okay, hey. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Oh, Francesco, we're in the wrong spot. Oh no. Uh, God damn. What? Well. We might as well do a lightning talk then. Sure. Hello. Hello. Oh, by the way, you have one minute, so don't oh, yes. drink too oh, much. Have one minute. By the way, um, first of all, we would like to thank the organizers of EuroPython for giving us the opportunity to give a remote talk because, you know, we're so remote um, that we can't even see the venue from here um, right now. But, well, while we're at it, we just wanted to take a minute to tell you about the social event that's happening tomorrow. Yeah, we have a social event tomorrow. And we have only a few tickets left, so if you want, grab your ticket now. It's going to be tomorrow at the venue, starting from 7, 7.30ish. Live entertainment, uh, food, some drinks, lots of fun. And dancing, Irish dancing. Um, also. Yes, and also, last but not the least, um, since we are almost towards the end of the first day, just want to say a huge um, um, thank you to all the volunteers and the ops team for putting together such a brilliant um, hybrid event. Um, cheers, and enjoy your pint. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye. So uh, this is how we do a remote lightning talk. So um, yeah, so you get the idea. Um, also, a few things about lightning talk, in case you're new here, that uh, at the, you know, when we invite the speaker and stuff, and then uh, we, if it's almost to its the time that they have to get off stage, we'll do the tab so they have to finish the sentence and then we'll give them a big round of applause. So uh, for normal lightning talk, we have five minutes for all the speakers to sign up. So first one will be um, Ram Rat Ratchum. Uh, that's your talk, so please get ready. Uh, come on stage and get your stuff set up. Um, and then the next one is... Um, uh, sorry, I, I'm very bad at names and I can't read very well. Uh, the Theus? Yes, yes, that's your talk. So you also uh, get ready because uh, we don't have much time. Um, and then uh, that would be so. Like, if you remember, you sign up on the first page. Just get ready somewhere there uh, because you'll be on stage before you know it. Um, so uh, I think that's more or less it. While uh, people are setting it up, uh, I also want to um, let you know that those uh, the, the, where you saw the first remote lighting talk actually happens in the ferryman just opposite uh, the venue, and uh, they do Guinness, so you can try. <laughs> Who has tried the Guinness here? Oh, actually, it's ready. Okay, I will talk to you later. You have five minutes. There you go. Wait, wait. Uh, oh, I didn't set it up yet. Sorry. Oh, really? My, co my computer stuck, seriously. Okay, it's not connected yet, right? Uh, yes, sorry. Um, okay. Embarrassing. So, so usually I start the timer when it's ready, but uh, okay, now you have the screen, so let's start. Right. I practiced like 50 times, you know, never have it until now. Okay, uh, hi everybody. Uh, thanks for coming to my talk. Uh, my name is Ram. This is talk about my research. Uh, my research into using machine learning to understand our society. So in a way that's some, somewhat related to the previous talk about the way that the AI interacts with uh, how we deal with each other. So this is something that is insanely interesting to me and now I'm working on it full time. And I have four minutes, I guess, to convince you of how interesting that is. And I hope that after, this, after the session, you're going to check out my site and sign up to that mailing list to get monthly updates about my research. So m my goal is to use machine learning to understand people and how, how they behave to each other. And, and this is a subfield of machine learning called multi-agent reinforcement learning. So 
and when I say I can get answers, I want to get answers to the big question that we have about human society, that sounds, I mean, it is enticing, but it sounds vague. So let's look at a demo. So this is an AI playing the video game Mario. And the, the interesting thing here is that the AI hasn't been told the rules of the game. They just took an AI and they hooked it up to the Mario system, and it just figured out how to play the game on its own without even knowing the rules, right? It just got the video output, played for a thousand hours. First, it just did random stuff, but through trial and error, it figured out how to win. So I think this demo is insanely cool. I mean, we've seen a bunch of cool AI demos in the last couple of years, like DALI 2 or GPT-3. They sort of mimic the way that human behave, like the way we, we, we talk or, or the way that we look like. But this demo looks very human, not because it's trying to be human, but because it's just a creature out there making decisions, decisions in an unknown environment and dealing with the consequences of these decisions. So when I see this demo, I think, super cool, I want to take it further. And the place I want to take it further is to have multiple Marios, to have multiple AI agents that uh, move around in the world and meet each other. Like, I want to know, I mean, are they going to be friends? Are they going to do stuff together and have like a society? I mean, that is something, something insanely interesting to me. So lots of other researchers had the same idea. And this is a video by OpenAI. It's called OpenAI Hide and Seek. I recommend you check out the full video on YouTube. And they've got two teams of AI agents playing against each other. And like the red team are trying to find the blue team, and each team is developing strategies to beat the other team. And they're developing these strategies on their own, and each strategy is sort of like an answer to the strategy, to the strategy of the other team. So this is an awesome demo. You, you, you hope to check out the, the whole thing, but there is something about it which I don't like. There is a very, very beautiful cooperation there, but that's because the agents are rewarded based on whether their team succeeded or failed. Like in a way, they are the perfect team players because because they are sort of the hive mind. They all just want this team to succeed. There is no, there is no conflict between the individual and, and the team. And that's what, what's interesting to me. I want to see the behavior of, of creatures that are part of a team, they're able to, to act as a group, but not, be, but not because they are a hive mind, because they are individuals who choose to act as a group. So many other researchers have tried the same thing. And as soon as they put multiple AI agents in environment, um, they immediately become the worst people possible. Uh, let's see a demo. This is, demo, this is research, research from DeepMind from about a year ago. This is a, an AI agent playing a game where it wants to eat as many apples as possible. If it eats all the apples off a tree, the tree dies, and there are no more apples. So the single agent is playing the game perfectly um, because it, it's letting the, the apples regenerate. Um, here's what happens when we have multiple agents with multiple trees. Right. Immediately, they, ki they, kill all, they eat all the apples and kill all the trees. And the interesting thing here is that we have seen this behavior in real people. Sort of tragedy of the commons, very familiar to us. And that's something that's frustrating to us about, about uh, real people. And like, when it happens with people, we, we can say, that's just the way people are, that's just the way it is. But now with multi-agent RL, we have an opportunity to look at it as a, as a social dynamics problem. We can say this, this is the exact same algorithm as a single agent, but the social dynamics is a problem. So we have a chance here to sort of improve the way that we treat each other and collaborate on, on large-scale projects, which, which is, to me, insanely interesting. I have lots more to say. I ran out of time. Please check out my site, and please uh, sign up to get monthly updates about my progress. Thank you. Amazing. And you are right on time, so that's perfect. Um, OK, so uh, uh, you, you know, uh, thing is, thing is, thing is. Okay. Uh, next is Pravlo. Pravlo uh, is the building a, a approachable applications. And after that, we'll slide in a one-minute uh, special lightning talk uh, uh, from Hugging Face. Um, so uh, then after is uh, Ben North, if you're here. Hello. Okay. Uh, yes. So please get your computer ready because uh, once we plug in uh, and yeah. if your computer is on screen, then you are on. But I am still seeing a black screen for some reason. There um, we go. Hello, what happened? Uh, technical support. Ah. Oh, oh okay. It could, yeah, okay. It kind of worked, or it that. doesn't work. Okay. Yeah. Well, okay. That's good. Okay. There you go. This your time starts now. So um, we all know that building distributed systems is hard uh, and a cause of a lot of headaches. Uh, and I want to introduce you to a product called Cyclone DDS, which is an implementation of uh, DDS itself, which is an open standard that can help you build distributed systems 
uh, and hopefully take those headaches uh, away from you. Uh, so first, uh, a quick overview of why distributed systems even cause headaches. And it's because the distributed nature of a system creeps into all the scopes of your software. Uh, at every point, you have to uh, take into account that, oh, uh, what's, the, what's the latency on this? When is this coming in? Or where do I have to send my data? Um, is there some dynamic agent in the system that I also want to send my data to? Uh, and this really causes uh, distributed systems to often fall short in uh, the, the real-time domain. Uh, the complexity can hugely explode and be a full-time job for many developers at the same time. And if you want to change something, suddenly you have 50 applications to update uh, because uh, somewhere a new temperature sensor has one more data point that it uh, adds to the system. So uh, what is DDS? Uh, DDS stands for Data Distribution Service. Uh, it's a common standard uh, standardized by the Object Management Group in 2002 to 2004. Um, that abstracts away a distributed system into a global data space. Uh, with topics, with writers, and readers. Uh, you specify a delivery contract uh, for each of those readers and writers that says, okay, uh, this data should be reliable, or I only want to see the highest priority system, uh, so there is a uh, way to fall back uh, if something crashes. Uh, maybe you want to keep data on disk or uh, uh, so you can reprovision an application that crashes uh, and have end-to-end -end encryption. Uh, it's an open standard. There are multiple implementations, so you don't have vendor lock-in. Uh, and even these implementations are interoperable on the wire, so you can have systems from multiple companies talking to each other without problems. Now, Cyclone DDS is an uh, open-source implementation of DDS, uh, just developed on GitHub. Uh, we have C, C++, and Python APIs, uh, which, again, interoperable. You don't know what's on the other end. Might be another programming language. Your objects are uh, just compatible with each other. Uh, and in my humble opinion, we have the only nice DDS Python API uh, available. The one by the big American company, RTI, is absolutely horrendous. And we have a friendly BSD3 license. You can use it in anything. And uh, we, uh, I work for a commercial company, but all of our code is donated to the Eclipse Open Software Foundation. So uh, we can't take it away from you, even though we make it. Uh, here's some example code, uh, which uh, I'll put this uh, presentation somewhere, and you can look back at it. But these two applications, uh, you can start in a single process within one machine or over the network or even across the internet. You don't have to change any code and they will talk to each other. Um, and that is my talk. Um, if you want a demo or discuss something at all, please talk to me in the next coming days. Thank you so much. Wow, if everybody is as efficient, that would be great. So thank you so much. And next speaker, please, um, get ready. And um, yeah, so I was talking about the Guinness. Who already had a real Irish Guinness? Yay, congratulations. Um, you have tried a real Guinness. Does it really taste different? Yes, yeah, okay, good. Um, but also, it's not like, you know, uh, is Dublin not just offer uh, Guinness, the, the, the black stuff. <laughs> um, we also offer other like good food and uh, whiskey and all the stuff. So uh, while you're here, you get... okay, so watch the lighting talk first. Okay, so there you go, five minutes. Here we go. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Pavlo Andrichenko. Um, I've been a member of the EuroPython community since Bilbao. Um, uh, what do I do for, like, what's my day job? What do I do for a living? I build uh, production applications uh, in Python, and I try to make them supportable. Uh, what do I mean by that? Uh, well, I've been doing it for, actually, for over 
10 years, so I think I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, I obviously don't have much time, so I will not go into the cost and benefits, why an application should be supportable. So rather what I'm um, going to give you is two bullet points uh, to remember that I think is important. So why is it important to make uh, your, to build your system, to build your application, to make it as supportable as possible? It's because the chance, if, if you work in a, on a distributed system, uh, whether it's an open source project or whether you work for a medium or large company, the chances are that it's not going to be you who will be dealing with the production busts, or uh, likewise, it's not going to be you uh, who will be enhancing the code that uh, you've been working on. Um, okay, so when it comes to um, when it comes to dealing with support incidents with the production busts, so, so someone and presumably someone else will be investigating those. How, how can you help them? How can you um, make their job easier? Um, the, if, if you want to Google, so there is a framework um, oh, whose name escapes me now. Um, so which uh, one of these steps, one of the steps of the framework is uh, logging. So you need to provide uh, uh, as much information as possible about the, uh, about the problem. Uh, and you should also include as much context, so the sort of concept, concept of tracing, include as much information about the context. If there is data involved, where the data came from, um, username, uh, transaction ID, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, specifically in Python, you need to be smart about uh, dealing with exceptions and how you handle exceptions. Um, if you re-raise an exception, make sure that you use raise or raise from to preserve the uh, stack trace because uh, that will contain a lot of valuable information. Okay, and uh, when it comes to uh, writing code and um, if someone else, if there are chances that someone else is gonna be working on the code or extending the code that you are working on, well, you need to bear in mind uh, that readability and uh, common paradigms um, tend to win in the long run. So bear that in mind when uh, sort of writing fancy code. And um, always comments and meaning meaningful, like meaningful doc strings go a long way. Um, so I hope that's common sense. So just to recap, um, to make sure that the system that you're working on is as supportable as possible. Um, first keyword, I guess, that I want you to remember is logging. So log, uh, log as much information as possible. Uh, even though your, co your code could be as tested, so you could have high co coverage, you, you, can, you, can, you can have 100% coverage, you can use hypothesis testing, but still, production incidents do happen. So to help those people who deal with the, those um, incidents, uh, include as much information as possible. And for those people who will be maintaining the code that you are writing, make sure that your code is readable and understandable. Thank you. Great, amazing, so right on time. And uh, next uh, lightning talk will be our special lightning talk that's like one minute long uh, from the team of Hugging Face. Yep, uh, yes, no you're not, or Oh, Pablo is ready. Okay, we will swap the order a little bit and we will let Pablo give uh, his one minute lightning talk and then uh, we can have Hugging Face coming back uh, after Dominic, maybe? Okay. Right, I will be quick. Hello, uh, I'm Pablo. I'm the release manager of Python 3 and 3.11, uh, but I'm here because I have something to confess. I come from the future and the future is bright. As you know, we have cured all diseases, everyone is happy, nobody complains on Twitter, it's cool. But all of this was possible only because of one reason. The CPython team released successfully 3.11 with no bugs, right? And my mission, I have came to the past to tell you that, you know, we need to, we need to achieve this future. And the only way to do it is if you help us to test Python 3.11, right? Um, we uh, have released Python 3.11 uh, beta 4. Uh, we only have one more beta and then we will enter release candidate. And it turns out that Python 3.11, you know, it's going to be super fast and super cool and it's going to solve all problems in the world. But, uh, you know, has a lot of changes, so it's a bit unstable at the moment. 
and we need to make sure that we are not going to break your super cool library or your ML model or I don't know your your um, uh, joke generator or whatever you do. Um, so please go and download that uh, Python 3.11 beta, whatever beta, and try your test. Uh, it's very important. Uh, save the future. Just exactly one minute. It's like 59 seconds. Amazing. So next we will have uh, Ben Off. Yes, you're ready. Okay, you can come on stage, and you will have more than one minute. You have five minutes. So uh, yeah, while we are setting up, I will tell you a little bit of my uh, funny story uh, that I experienced in uh, Dublin. So uh, not this time, but like uh, around half a year ago, I came to uh, Dublin for visiting, and I joined a tour. So there was a tour guy, right? A uh, local tour guy. I'll tell you later. Um, okay, so five minutes. There you go. Start now. Uh, thank you. Hello, my name is Ben. I'd like to tell you about a research project I'm working on with colleagues at Trinity College Dublin and with TU Dublin. We're supported by the Science Foundation Ireland. We're building a system to help people start learning Python. This is MIT's Scratch environment. Is anybody here familiar with Scratch? Oh, lots, lots, great. Um, so this is many young students, how they get their first exposure to the ideas of programming. They do it through Scratch. It's engaging, you have graphics, you have sounds, you have sprites, which have scripts which run concurrently in response to events like key presses or taps or clicks. You write these scripts by joining together action blocks like move forward, play this trumpet sound. You have control blocks like repeat these other blocks 10 times. Scratch has a stage where your program runs and it has a coding area where you assemble your program from the available blocks. With this system, young people gain what the Raspberry Pi Foundation have called Scratch superpowers. They can make very cool things. Often, students then start to learn Python, which is a good thing. I don't need to convince this audience. But if you're used to writing programs like this, then Python can be a very different experience. Somebody expressed the feeling as, all the color goes out of the rainbow. Um, students often have to write sequential text input, text output programs. Usually there's nothing like sprites. Usually there's no graphics. Usually there's no sound. Usually there's no concurrency. And on top of all these changes to their mental model of how you write a computer program, the learner also has to very carefully type in their code instead of building it from blocks. For many learners, this is too much of a leap. They lose interest at a crucial stage in their computer science journey. We think it would be better if students could keep their interest in computer science and computer programming. We want people to be able to make their own technology, not just consume other people's, have fun being creative. We want people to have an idea of how software works so they can better understand the public debates about, for instance, bias in AI systems that we were just hearing about. Now, I have to admit, I have cherry-picked a bit here. There are systems like Pygame Zero and tools like Mu, which help a lot. But even with these, Python coding is still a very different experience to creating games or visual art with Scratch. To help students with this leap, we've built Pitch, a bridge from Scratch to Python. It lets learners keep their Scratch knowledge of how you write a computer program, sprites, graphics, sounds, event-driven concurrency, while they learn the Python language. It's Python through the lens of Scratch. Pitch is live now. It has the same stage as Scratch. It has a coding area like Scratch, but where they write their event-driven code in Python rather than by joining blocks together. They learn about Python's syntax and semantics in a familiar setting and paradigm. Pitch is free software, open source. It runs in the browser using Sculpt. We've been trialing this in schools, as well as places like Coder Dojos, Technology Summer Camps, computer gaming courses. The feedback has been positive, so we think we have a good approach here about how to help students learn Python. We've started to explore some ideas about help, how to help learners move from pitch onto real-world Python, maybe web or data science, where the power of Python lets them do things they couldn't do in Scratch. We're working on a simpler UI to avoid some of the boilerplate code. We've got proof-of-concept physical computing working. Everybody likes flashing lights. For a school setting, there's a lot needed beyond the core system. 
We do have learning materials built into Pitch, but we need to expand them, align them better with the curriculum. That's why we've built Pitch, what it is, where we plan to take it. We'd love to talk to anybody involved with Python in education. We're mostly thinking of school students aged from maybe 12 up to 17. We'd love more people to try Pitch with their students, give us feedback. We'd love to learn from educators about what would make their classroom experience smoother, maybe auto-grading of assessments. We'd love to talk with people who could fund or sponsor further development. Um, please get in touch if you'd like to talk with us about any of this. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you so much. It's a very nice lighting talk. Um, so, is Dominic here already? No, not ready. So, while uh, Dominic, are you here? Please come here and get ready. So, while we are finding him, oh, oh, it's you. Okay, uh, so maybe I will let uh, Dominic go first. Yeah, is that okay, Alex? Yeah. Okay, Dominic, come here. Yeah, come here, come here, come here. <laughs> so, uh, Chin, uh, if we offer one a little bit, then maybe Chin can also go as well. Are, are you here, Chin? Get ready. Yeah. Okay, okay. So, um, yeah, so talk about my tour guide. So, he said that, um, so don't take it as an official advice, right? It's not an official advice. The tour guide talked to us and tell us that, like, um, don't follow the green man. Um, so, I guess, uh, well, jailwalking is a thing here in Dublin. Um, okay, so, lightning talk. Uh, five minutes less. Yeah, so, hi, uh, I'm Dominic, or Disconnected, and this is Programming Languages Are Hard, or maybe should I say, Programming is Hard in general. Uh, so we'll talk about a few issues. Uh, the first one is file permission issues. So let's look at bash versus programming langs in terms of uh, file permissions. So we have an IPython environment here. Uh, and so let's maybe create some, some file like y. Uh, and as you can see, this file has this, those, those kinds of permissions. And now if you do something like chmode 700 on this file, and then you well, look, look it up again, it has proper permissions, right? Uh, so let's try to do the same in, uh, in Python. So, you know, OS, CH mode, uh, the Y, and 700. Now, if you look over this file, it has completely different permissions. Um, yeah, and that's a bit problematic. And, you know, the issue here is that uh, this is decimal, and the CH mode, CH mode basically expects the permissions in octal numbers. So uh, to make it proper, we would have to do this, right? And then we can see this is the expected result. But what this actually did here, uh, because we can see those weird permissions, like we can write to this file as a user, uh, we can uh, read it as, as a group and like execute or write to it, and we can read, and there's this T, this T is, is called a sticky bit. Uh, it's not very useful in, in this case, but uh, yeah, there is something like this on Linux. But basically, this means that you know we kind of expected the file to be only readable, writable, and execute, executable by us. But we ended up with a file that everyone can read, which is, which can be disastrous. Not, you know, it can be a security issue in the end. Um, so yeah, let's maybe look how people deal with it, or like, do they make such bugs? So if we go go over a website called GrabUp, uh, that's like a random search over uh, Git repos. It's not very it's not that good, like, uh, it has some limitations. But if we go over here and, like, type some kind of regular expression like this, where, you know, we are looking of, for OSCH mode with some whatever name and permissions that do not start with zero, then we can see that people actually do such, mis do such mis mistakes. And, you know, they can end up with uh, incorrect file permissions that may then be readable by others. And if it's some secrets file, then it can be a huge problem. Uh, obviously, it's not only about Python. Like, if we remove the OS, OS dot here and, like, search again, you can see that, you know, in Kotlin, they do the same. Obviously, this may actually be uh, proper here. Like, they have a comment here saying that, you know, this 448 is an octal 0700. So probably this one is correct here. Uh, but usually, it's not so correct. And um, by the way, uh, one more thing maybe. Uh, I will just show you that this oct 700 is basically this permission. Uh, and we can, of course, compare it to uh, doing this manually. So 0, 0, sorry, 1, 4, 2, 7, 4, y. And I can show you that, oh, oops. I can show you that, you know, this is the incorrect permission here, right? Um, another example, you can look for this particular case because, you know, that was kind of the problematic one. Uh, 
And as you can see, people also do it in Java, in Python. Well, OK, it's a test project in some other Python code. Um, but this, you know, as I said, GrabUp is just very limited, so it doesn't really show all GitHub results here. That's the first thing. And second of all, there are other functions that have the similar problem, like os.open will also allow you to provide uh, permissions as well. Um, OK, um, so I have a random thought here, or maybe a wishful thinking. You know, maybe programming languages should allow you to uh, define in their type system that a given uh, type should be an integer octal or an integer hex value uh, when you type in an integer literal, because then we would not have those kind of issues, at, at least when someone hard codes the value uh, and, not, and doesn't provide uh, you know, uh, it as a variable uh, that is defined somewhere else. Um, obviously, this should be int oct here, not hex. <laughs> Um, yeah, and maybe MyPy could detect it. Um, okay, another issue is about regular expressions. So, you know, um, there is this meme that when you are using regular expressions, you have actually two problems. And uh, one problem with regular expression is something like this. If you have a regular expression like this, you know, this act those dots here are, are, are actually meaning that, you know, this is any character. So if you want to match domains and write a regular expression like this, this is an issue. And obviously, people do such mistakes. And it's pretty trivial to find them. Uh, I even found one in Signal Desktop. Uh, this is like an encrypted messenger. Uh, and they had something like this, supported me media domains regular expression. Um, yeah, and they had an issue like this. But there are other as well. Um, yeah. Thank um, you very much. OK, you thanks. Last slide? OK, thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so unfortunately, yeah, this is a little bit overrun, but that's fine. Um, next, uh, I think Alex wants to show something for five, 10 seconds, so I'll let him do it. Um, yeah, so, um, well, I think you, you take more than 10 seconds to, to show it. No, it's not? OK. Well, you need a, oh, well. Uh, Oh, okay. Otherwise, I've got to kick you out uh, because you take more than 10 seconds already. Um, so, right. Uh, no, uh, the screen. Come on. Ten, come on. You only have 10 uh, seconds. Come on. Uh, come on. Okay. On. All right. Okay. Who one, likes, who likes two. Basil? <laughs> okay. We will tell you more about Basil tomorrow at the Lightning Talks. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's it, the shortest Lightning Talk ever in Euro Python. Thank you so much. Okay. So, uh, we have Chin. Chin. Also, uh, Hacking Face, uh, kind of, you, you missed your slot. Uh, Omar from Hacking Face, are you, are you still here? No? No, then we'll have Chin, then um, that's it for today, after Chin. But uh, Chin has something to talk about the, um, oh, the sports Python thing. Um, does it work for your computer? How come there's no USB? Uh, you have a dongle at hand, isn't it? A what? You, you have the adapter at yeah, hand, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, okay. So uh, let's hope this doesn't take too long to set up. So um, yeah, so Dublin has a lot to offer, um, but uh, do be careful when you're on the road. Uh, I cycle in the morning here, and I have a few bruises already because the, the bicycles are too big for me. Um, and I struggle to get on, you know. Um, yeah, so, but um, yeah, Chin, you have five seconds. Uh, <laughs> sorry, five minutes. <laughs> it gets shorter and shorter, isn't it? Okay, five minutes, let's go. It's discrimination. Um, uh, hi everyone, uh, okay, five seconds, no, five minutes. Okay, um, so I was writing to some of you today, so sorry if I'm repeating this, but never mind, tough. Um, TLDR, uh, so for the rest of you who didn't know, there are some new educational Python freebies coming your way. Uh, they are specifically sports related, um, open educational resources, um, or OER. The origin is that the EPS kindly accepted a grant proposal from my EdTech startup, a few months ago to seed an initiative called Sports Python, which is what I spend all the money on. No, I'm joking, joking. This is our setup contribution. Um, I am proud of this, though, because we got PSF uh, sign-off on using the Python Snake uh, logo. I don't know if Mark Andre is here, but thank you to the Trademark Committee for that. Um, and why? Why are we doing this project? Uh, to help make Python education more accessible and enable a more inclusive and representative Representative community. Yes, I spelled that right. Thank you. Um, some evidence. Oh, microphone's here. Some evidence. Um, sports as a gateway to Python works. So the proposal for this open educational resource project is actually based on a um, proprietary closed initiative that I have been doing with um, some disadvantaged kids in South London schools. 
So these are actually a cohort of, if you know anything about education, then this will make sense. If not, don't worry. Uh, year 12, uh, BTEC IT students. So they had no coding, no Python experience. A couple had some coding experience, but very little. And in four sessions doing a related football analytics program, they loved it. Look, see, happy smiley faces. Uh, that's me in the middle um, and the stripes. OK, so the first project deliverables um, are, I'm sorry, I'm biased. It is going to be on football because I know it best. But I have been speaking to some people who have been um, pitching things like rugby and basketball and rock climbing. Um, but the first project was based on this match, was an Arsenal Man U match. I actually dislike both teams, so that made it very easy to, to code up because I am a Chelsea fan. Um, so the, the data, I basically sat there and I coded up uh, uh, almost 2,000 um, <laughs> records of events from that match. So that was a pain. However, uh, oh, well, so there are some artwork bonus deliverables uh, that we have created. So these are some beautiful um, icons, which I got a designer to do, which again is, will be part of the, it's an open educational resource for everyone to use. So alongside the core docs, which will have code examples for how to use the open, educa open educational resources. So this, for example, is like using the data and the coordinates and the icons to recreate the first Arsenal goal. Uh, this is a oh, this is Ronaldo's um, touches from the match, uh, and then this is a heat map of Ronaldo's again. I think touches. So stuff like that is the kind of things which the project will enable. The docs will show people how to create. So it's for you know learners, not just kids, but anyone, but also educators to use. Uh, sustainability is a challenge. So if you have, if you're not using it because you already know how to do Python, uh, if you have time and or your organisation or someone you know has money, that would be great. I'm speaking to you know sponsors here. You know, hello. Um, because uh, <laughs> I do have a repo. It's got nothing in it. Um, but I took the name, so that's cool. I also have the Twitter handle, but again, I have <laughs> no time to actually do any tweets. Um, so a lot of help would be useful. And if that has sounded interesting at all, do come visit my table on the ground floor to find out more. It's the one with the balloons and like the grass pitch. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And I think that uh, kind of ties up our lightning talk. Sorry if you can't get in today. Uh, you can try again tomorrow. Uh, also, as a reminder, there are remote slots, so um, you know you don't have to go to the ferryman um, to give the lightning talk. But if you're a remote participant, genuinely like not in Dublin, uh, you could you could sign up for lightning talk. You can give your uh, your lightning talk at home. So um, yeah, so uh, that's it for today. And thank you so much for joining. And I hope you enjoy your evening in Dublin. Thank you so much.